der Triathlon Show, die 163. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of that Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview coach Ian Armiger. Ian is a professional swimming coach and the former director of swimming at Loughborough University, a Great Britain team head coach and Olympic coach. In the interview that we will go into in just a minute, Ian discusses his coaching style and model. We discuss swimming technique, we discuss specific advice for triathletes and much, much more. But before all of that, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. If you haven't already done so, uh, then I would highly recommend you listen to one of the interviews that I've done with Andy Blow. You can just go to scientifictriathlon.com and uh, in the search bar, type in his name, Andy Blow. And we have discussed several times on the topic of electrolytes, hydration, and uh, race hydration and nutrition planning that can be really, really good for you to get into. Because now really is a great time to start working on your hydration and nutrition plans for racing as you probably have a long time if you're in the Northern Hemisphere until your races. And it can really take a, a fair amount of time to nail down what really, really works optimally for you. So spend these winter months on the trainer perhaps, experimenting with that and use the information that Andy has provided on the podcast in the past as some guidance to get started. You can get 15% off the electrolytes of precision hydration with the promo code that triathlon show 15 and thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are the world leading manufacturers of wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. In terms of their eyewear category, they have tons of customization options that I want to highlight. Uh, that is if you are in the US in the prescription glasses specifically. And they also have things like home try on options. Prescription glasses are not yet available through the European shop, unfortunately, but there are tons of other really, really good equipment choices there for triathletes, including things like the, the Maverick X2 wetsuit, which is my racing wetsuit, uh, the flagship model of Roka's lineup, but all of Roka's wetsuits come with things like the patented arms up technology, as do their tri suits as well. So plenty to get into there, and uh, there is uh, still some time ahead of Christmas, so perhaps you can do some of your Christmas shopping on Roka.com. You can get a 20% discount with the promo code that you can get on Roka.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Ian Armiger. Welcome to That Triathlon Show, Ian. How are you doing this morning? Oh, fantastic, Michael. I'm looking forward to uh, interviewing on your, on your show, and I hope that your, uh, your listeners you know, take something away from it today. I'm sure they will. It's about swimming. So usually, as we have discussed a bit in pre-interview, that's uh, the weakness of most draft fleets. So, uh, so usually these int interviews are really popular and uh, there always seems to be some, some nuggets that, uh, that listeners can take away. But let's, uh, just, fantastic. let's just start by uh, you giving an introduction of yourself to the audience and telling us about your background. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ian Armager. And uh, I, as a kid, I, I swam on the, uh, the British team and, um, you know, as a senior, sometimes I was on the team, sometimes not. Usually about British number four, five, or six on the hundred free. Uh, so sometimes I was in the really four by hundred men and not. Um, but I almost started coaching as soon as I retired from swimming. And believe it or not, that was 1973. Oh my word! And uh, I became a full time coach in 1982. Uh, so that's a long time ago. And uh, went to my first Olympics as a coach in 1984. And since then, I've had swimmers on six Olympic teams. And in 1997, or between 97 and 90, 2012, I was the director of swimming at Loughborough University. Um, and with, with my colleagues, we built uh, the team from pretty much small beginnings to be a powerhouse of world swimming. And from 2013, I've been a coaching consultant, still attached to Loughborough. Uh, Loughborough colours are purple, and I think my blood runs purple, to be honest. Um, in terms of experience 
of the areas we're going to talk about today. I mean, I have a you know pro experience with age group swimming, but to be honest, my forte is senior swimming, uh, eighteen plus. Uh, the, the vice chancellor of Loughborough University once said, "Ian, you're a round peg in a round hole. That the fit with senior athletes, student athletes is perfect." And in terms of triathlon, Michael, and again, I wouldn't, pref- you know, say I was an expert in triathlon by any means or open water swimming, but you know, I shared the pool with Loughborough High Performance Triathlon uh, team, and m- the coaches of the team are very good friends of mine, and we interchange ideas. Um, you know, Adam Elliott, Gavin Smith, Ben Bright when he was there, some of the guys that you might know, Dan Salcedo. And I occasionally do work now, some technical work with the triathletes. And we have had actually a number of our swimmers who through talent transfer have moved from swimming to take up triathlon and have been very successful and be- often become professional triathletes. So that's the kind of background really. Yeah, and uh, to to add a bit to that uh, discussion about triathlon, you were recommended by a triathlon coach uh, that I trust very uh, very much, uh, David Tilbury Davis. So, uh, so I oh, think fantastic! That that's, yeah, that's I mean, not... I actually had a had an email this morning about participating in a, a forthcoming conference, maybe in December. It's it's organized by um, triathlon, so. Yeah. So, yeah. and I said to them, "Oh, I'm actually doing a talk this morning, an interview for the uh, that triathlon show." So it was very interesting. Yeah, you can see see this as the warm up. <laughs> so uh, let's let's move on a bit. By the way, I should add also that it is super impressive that you've had swimmers on six Olympics. That's uh, that's really fantastic. Uh, but uh, let's move on to talking about in broad strokes about your coaching uh, philosophy or your coaching principles. Yeah, Michael. Well. I think I, I, I kind of split this into two things when people talk about it. And with the, with the young coaches that I mentor, I talk about a coaching style and a coaching model. So my coaching style, I guess, is a, a very holistic approach. It's about coaching the person um, and the importance of the coach-athlete relationship is key to me. That relationship is absolutely vital. The trust between coach and athlete and so you can look after them in many many ways so it's not all about them coming the easy bit is them coming to the pool and go up and down the pool in different ways different technical issues those kind of things the more difficult thing is coaching the person and looking after them in terms of life lifestyle uh, balance other things in their life so treating them as a person so you coaching the person and training the event that kind of analogy and recognizing that there are individual differences. So recognizing that what works for one athlete might not necessarily work for another one and trying to find the right buttons to press. So that would be my kind of style. My coaching model is very much about specificity of training. So addressing the components of the event, the components of performance. And I'm a a big fan of race profiling. So looking at those smaller components or details of an event the, the differences, the small differences that I can make. So it's, it's like a performance by design uh, model rather than by accident. And uh, I guess for me, my range is probably 50 meters, 100 to four. I have had good 800 and 1500 people and I have had some good open water people, but uh, I would probably say that, you know, the 5Ks and the 10Ks are not my forte really. And my passion doesn't lie there. Although I do have some experience in those areas. Um, and I guess one of the other things, Michael, is something that's come trendy. And at the time, we didn't know that what it was called. But we looked at the, I guess people said we had a reverse periodization model, a, a sort of a speed up model. And we can talk about a little bit about that later. But that's my, my kind of my style and my model. Um, and I hope, you know, that makes sense to your, to your listeners, really. Yeah, uh, I want to uh, dig a little bit deeper there in the model, but also going back to the uh, to, to the co- the way that you coach the person. Can you give an example, maybe of uh, I don't know if you view it this way, but you have people have different kind of almost like archetypes of how they behave and uh, and how you then need to adjust as uh, the way that you uh, that you interact with them. So, so can you give, give an example of how, how you might do that when you're coaching the person as you talked about? Yeah, well, I, th- I think, Michael, it's, it's interesting because it's almost like lots of things have all happened at once right here. As you said, 
coming to, to talk with the shelf and also messages I've had this morning, but literally about an hour and a half before I've come on here to speak with you, I was having a conversation with a, a, a double Olympian, ex-double Olympian and former world record holder, uh, world champion Janine Belton, who is now coming up to 40 years of age. And she was working for uh, Lane 4 Management Consultants and wrote an article in 2012, which I can forward to you, um, it's called It Takes Two. So it's about our journey. Because I coached her from she was 12 till she was 24, 25. Uh, you know, followed me to Loughborough, studied, did a master's degree there. And uh, I think, again, I don't know whether you post things on your website, but, but that could be an article that might be interesting to you. So obviously she would say that, again, it was this idea of trust, total trust that I would – do the right things by her in terms of her preparation, um, looking after her as an individual. And our relationship at 12 was clearly very different from it was going to be 24. So understanding those developmental stages in their life, every every athlete has goes through those stages at different times in their life and have different challenges as they go along. So, you know, you might say, oh, well, it's easy coaching senior swimmers, you know, they're, they're, they're adult, they're focused, they're committed, they're all of this. But for sure, you know, 18 to 24 year olds have, the, have their issues in life that you need to help them with also. Um, so, it, it, you know, Janine would be an example of looking after the person, coaching the person, and then training the event uh, in addition to that. What are some examples? It doesn't have to be Janine, it can be anonymously, but uh, some challenges or issues that you've had to coach those senior 18 to 24 uh, or year olds <laughs> yeah well michael i often say to people because i say to the athletes that you can call me anytime night or day about anything and i will help you if i can and you name it I have dealt with it. <laughs> and sometimes I wish I'd never said it because, because you know, some of it's quite challenging. And I don't want to go into personal details and say not names, but all of the things, obviously, with the kids at 18 to 24 that are university are away from home. And, uh, you know, of course, they need to find their way in life and make mistakes as they go along and learn from those mistakes in life in general. But, but they also need a support mechanism to... Uh, you know, to help them when they face challenging or situations or difficulties. And it, you know, I'd, I'd rather not go into specifics on that, but obviously they have lots of lots of different issues that you can imagine as an 18 to 24 year old would have. Maybe it could be relationships for the first time, relationships breaking down, um, you know, going through those traumas, studies, issues with studies, uh, balancing life. Uh, you know, I say to them all, well, we, we say that there are three S's, uh, swimming, study, and social activities. And they can do two out of the three really well at university, but they can't do all three. So we would like to, obviously, you want them to choose studies and swimming with a little bit of social activities. Of course, when you're 18 to 24, 26, you need some social activities. That goes without saying. But it's getting the balance between that. And and it could be, you know, they're, cook, they're making their meals for the first time. So it's new diet nutritional advice, um, looking at your know, body shape and so on, and make, keeping them, making sure they're, 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 they're fueled correctly between bouts of exercise. So it is all of those little things that are away from the pool, because if they're not happy away from the pool, they're not going to be happy in the pool, and it isn't going to work. So that's my kind of holistic approach to what goes on, really. And have you ever experienced that maybe um, that you there have been a swimmer that you – maybe haven't managed to to coach the those personal aspects outside of the pool and then it has led to them kind of not progressing the way you would have wanted them to in the pool oh for sure i mean and, and again it could be that you know you i'm quite a layback kind of guy and, and and i'd like to think i get on quite well with most people but um, it is talking to the athletes about other things in their life. So it's not always about swimming and sport. Uh, it's about other things and showing interest in the other things in their life. Um, I guess people that sit outside of those parameters, when I, you know, maybe feel that it's, we're not, we haven't got the relationship that 
is working quite well and I'm, and I'm finding difficulty um, pressing the buttons. For us, the interesting thing is that in our setup for swimming, um, we had like six full-time swim coaches who each had a different style uh, and a different model. And if, you know, I felt that it would be better, that swimmer would be better swimming with another coach that might have a different, style and model which was more suitable then then they would move you know they could move to that group or vice versa the athlete could say well I don't think this is quite working so um you know I think I'd be better swimming with that coach to me as the director of the program it didn't really make a diff a problem because they just moved to another coach they didn't leave the program they just retained their membership of the program represented the team exactly the same and uh could swim with somebody else that maybe better at handling that person than myself. Yeah, yeah, but that's a but that's also a great example of uh having the I guess the self-awareness and and humility as well uh not not having the ego uh run oh, sure. so to say. Um and and another follow up on what you said about the model so you described being event specific and breaking the event down into its small components can can you exemplify what that might look like for your the events that you specialize in Yeah well, well Michael we, when the we, when we're looking at the event um you know again I said I used that phrase performance by design so it's almost like internalized we we prac you know in the US they say oh we're going to practice in 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 the UK we often say oh we're going training or whatever we're doing um so i like to think we're coming to perform specific actions so it might be general it might be energy systems well today we're going to look at aerobic endurance or anaerobic endurance or we're looking at speed development or we're looking at one of these areas other times it might be very specific in the event looking at their so, so our um, analysts will look at their races at major championships and then we could compare them with other people that maybe are better than them and say well look these are these are the areas that we need to improve on it could be the third 25 meters of the 100 it could be stroke rates it could be um you know distance per stroke it could be pacing it could be breathing patterns it could be all of those small components and one of the areas that um that interests me particularly was when we were looking at uh, a 100 meter freestyle girl that was swam the Lund uh, London Olympics in 2012, um, I, I'm thinking, well, a 50 meter freestyle time was absolutely stuck for about two years. It wasn't going anywhere, it's, which then affected a hundred because to, to improve a hundred time, I had to get a 50 down. And I looked at all ways to do this. And um, I was looking at, The problem was the first 15 meters of the race. So we would look at starting technique. So with the wedge blocks, we got the biomechanists and we moved the wedge block. Uh, we moved the wedge one notch forward, which increased power off the block. And then and we were in a very privileged position, okay, because we're surrounded by a lot of expertise in sports science. And I'll touch on that maybe later. But um, we had the naval architecture guys come from Southampton University And we had the swimmer on the end of a tether and towed them through the water at certain speeds and looked at kick frequency. So the you know, dolphin kicks off the off the start to get this power on the first 15 meters. And they were kicking at something like 135 kicks a minute. And we, li we lifted that to 150 kicks a minute for their suggestion that this was going to be more powerful for that person. And we put things in place uh, with a tempo trainer or with vertical kicking Uh, so many fly kicks in 10 seconds. You know, if you do 25 fly kicks, that's 150 kick rate. So we would look at that. Consequently, her 50 time improved from uh, 25.4, which you could set your watch by. She'd do that every pretty much time, to 24.8. Obviously, there are other wow. things, strength and power. But that affected the 100 because she could get out faster, which consequently she could make a 1.3 second improvement on the 100 meters freestyle. Yeah, uh, that's really great. Uh, great example. Uh, you have been coaching since 1973, I think you said. So yes. uh, you've seen many things come and go, many different eras of what's popular in swim coaching. Can, can you describe this development arc a bit and uh, what what pieces maybe have stuck and what pieces uh, you have personally let go of from what has come and been popular in the in the past? 
Yeah, Michael, I think um, going back to the thing about, you know, the individual differences, I think there is more, for certainly for myself, more awareness of that fact um, in, in coaching style and coaching model um, because there are many ways to, to get to the podium. And, uh, you know, swimmers who perform equally as well at an event uh, would train in very different ways and not train together. So, for example, a lot of our um, Olympians, they can, they can be in totally different groups, train with different coaches and train in very, very different ways, but be equally as good and uh, never train together. So if you think about in the past, Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte never trained together, even on training camps, never trained together. They were always apart. And uh, I think at the elite level, it has become more bespoke uh, and more sp- more individualized um, rather than everybody in the group doing the same thing. So certainly in my session, you, you could see 10 different things going on at the same time. They would have very bespoke programs. Um, so there, then you bring in the importance now, and I am talking about the elite level, the importance of the interdisciplinary teams because the coach, and we are very lucky, obviously, in that sense that we have resources. The coach can't know, possibly know everything about everything. <laughs> and uh, as long as the coach knows a little bit about some of these areas of biomechanics, physiology, nutrition, psychology, strength and conditioning, and so on, because they will balance the input of these services from an interdisciplinary team where the athlete is at the hub. And so you can develop their uh, performances and their skills. They can advise on those issues. And of course, that's their world. So they know way more than us, you know, way more than the coach. And I think the, the coach is balancing these services. And I think at the elite level, that's the difference now that you are dealing with, you are becoming a manager in a sense. You're dealing with interdisciplinary teams. You're dealing with all these inputs of all these services. And and again, at the very elite level, you're having to deal with sports agents, which is another thing. And, uh, you know, so so the world of the coach has has widened significantly. Um, at the at the sub-elite level, um, I guess this, you know, there is still a role for that. And it has become more about questioning the athlete, having getting the athlete to learn more about or be more aware of their bodies, their movements, uh, you know, just swim, swim knowledge, general all around awareness of what's going on for them. Yeah, that, that's really great, actually. And uh, it's something that I talked about in another interview uh, quite recently with uh, Sebastian Zeller about that sort of athlete-centered model with the coach as a, almost like a manager, as you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, like a facilitator, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, between between all of these different experts. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of training models, have is any significant changes that, that have come up just in terms of generalities even though at the end of the day as you say the individuality uh, comes into play at the at the end of the day i think uh michael i think I, I, when when um w- when we first started the program in 1997 96 at loughborough it, certainly in british swimming we we led from the front into when it came to land conditioning uh to improvement of of power and speed and back then not many people were doing uh olympic lifting for example in the gym not many people were doing med ball work and 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 we were actually led the field with that and people used to come and look at our land conditioning program and how it was was phased and was cyclical within the um and periodized within the training schedule so that, that was an area that has developed over the years, and now a lot of people have strength and conditioning coaches attached to their teams. But at that point, we did have those people, but we were layers and very quickly, or very, you know, very much with those guys. Um, and I also, again, we might touch on this later, but because I was surrounded by a lot of expertise there, I could get things from the track and field coaches, talk to different people, talk to the uh, gymnastics coach or the volleyball coach about jumping technique, knee angles for drive off the block, um, or again, the gymnastic coaches about rotation uh, for, for tumble turns. And we were looking at and getting information about all of those things. And I think 
in the past, there was a lot of sub-max swimming going on. Um, and again, it, it obviously depends on which events, but certainly for the, for the shorter events, there was still a lot of this idea of speed through endurance, which I wasn't sure how that worked, but that was a phrase that was bandied around. And I guess somebody asked me, did I make any mistakes in the early days? And I, of course, made plenty of mistakes when I started out. And one of my things would be, um, I probably worked too hard. I said, use it too hard. I'm not sure that's the right word, but too much volume and sub max swimming for my sprint guys. Uh, so if I turned the clock back, 30 years or something or 40 years, I'd probably put a little bit more of that speed because I did believe that people swam, you know, everybody swam 50, 60, 70 K a week. More was always better. And I think now people are beginning to think that, get the idea that more is not always better, that people will spend a lot of time trying to go as fast as they go, not necessarily a lot of distance trying to go as fast as they go. You know, back in the day, you saying Bolt, spent a lot of time trying to run 9.5 for the 100. He didn't spend a lot of distance trying to run 10 400s on the track. So I think that's one of the changes that has has developed over time. It's funny that you mentioned that and, and the use Usain Bolt as an example, because I, I had a conversation with Professor John Hawley uh, out of uh, Australia about this, and he said the exact same thing about swimming, that he, he doesn't understand why the short distance swimmers do so much volume and, and he doesn't understand how somebody like Michael Phelps or Kate Ledecky can win at everything from the hundred to the to the mm -hmm. fifteen hundred mm -hmm. or the eight hundred because it would be like Usain Bolt winning everything from the one hundred meter <laughs> on the track <laughs> to the five K, which, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is absolutely ludicrous. I think it's yeah. a massive I mean this is it's a mass because we get this all the time and it's a massive thing. I mean obviously swimming's not a natural movement. They, they you know you walk about on your legs all the time. So you know right from whatever age it is and so you have that the movements and the me mechanics and so on of, of walking and you have some muscle development there whereas in swimming it's you're in water it's alien to get to create power it's quite quite complex movements involved with the whole thing so there are are marked differences but yes that that is for me one of the areas that uh is a big question mark and i asked this and um when the kind of sets we were doing for developing speed endurance or whatever it was, some coach was coming. Oh yes, we do that, but it's but the session's eight thousand meters long. And I said, well, why does it need to be eight thousand meters long? They come in, they warm up, they, they do some lead-in sets, and they do the main set at this, you know, ten to fifteen beats below max, and then they loosen down, and then they go home, and it's four and a half thousand. They don't need to be here to swim eight thousand meters, and uh, they couldn't kind of get their head around that. And uh, it, it's a very interesting area. Yeah. And, well, you mentioned there, which leads me to the next question about swimming being a more complex movement and, and the foreign environment as well to try to produce power in the water. What are your thoughts around the, the mechanics, the technique in swimming and uh, yeah, how, to, how to improve that and, and get good at it? Well, I think practice, practice, and practice, but practicing the right things. Practice, just not just going in the pool and swimming up and down. It's submax activities with very, very poor technique. And I think that even for triathletes, that we need, they need to be stimulated quite often. I'll, and it has changed now. I have to say, from the, from what I've seen, but generally they would quite often come in, especially um, developing triathletes, not necessarily at the high performance level, but they'll, people will come in and they'll swim up and down the pool at sub-max for like 45 minutes or an hour non-stop, and then they get out and think that that's their session done. Um, whereas really for me, I think they need to play with the different energy systems. Um, they need to go fast in the water sometimes because they need to get that feel for the – you know, off the pontoon for that first little bit so they're up in the pack. And they need to hone their technique by doing skills and drills within their sessions and to mix it up. Uh, just to come in and swim at poor technique, 45 minutes to one hour continuously, is I, I'm not sure exactly what it's doing really. And obviously with, with triathletes, th there are other events to come. So the amount of speed work they do is, would be limited, of course, um, and it's all relative to, to the event 
that's being swum. And again, they've got to look at things like, uh, again, going back to this specificity, they look at um, swimming sometimes with a head up, sometimes with wetsuits on because that affects flotation, obviously, and affects technique. And also skills like going around boys, they need to look at integrate those kind of movements within the session. So that's the kind of thing that I would say um, would would be relevant for your for your triathletes out there. What do you think is the when you have a swimmer who starts swimming at seven eight years old or something? How how long does it take for them to develop what would be considered a a good technique, a good to the level that it's better than most most amateur triathletes at least? Uh, how how many years would that take? Do you say? Well, I think you can you can kind of. Um, through your various skills and drills and and concentrate on that and incorporate it within the main set. So it's no good doing just, you know, you, you you pay attention to these things by doing skills and drills and then all of a sudden they're swimming up and down and they're doing nothing like the, the, the skills and drills that you've practiced. So it's reinforcing that through the actual continuous, continuous swimming. And the coach needs to be aware of that and be mindful and always looking at uh, of what's going on with that. And, of course, Michael, I... As the swimmer progresses through the different age groups and they go through various growth spurts and their body shape changes, you need to be very mindful that, um, you know, let's say 12, 13, 14 girls, they could have been very good at 10, but all of a sudden their body shape changes so they lie differently in the water. And this can apply to 15, 16, 17, and that's, I'm generalizing. But obviously as the body, as through maturation, they'll, they'll lie differently in the water. Their arms and legs and limbs are different different uh, different sizes, different lengths. And so therefore, they need to get used to being that shape in the water. And what happens is, you know, that kind of plateauing, they can, even, they, can, they can plateau, not improve, despite doing lots of training, or they can actually regress in their performance. And it's the coach's job, let's say, to support them through those periods. And they, those periods can last a very long time. Um, they can last one two, three years or more. So it's keeping them engaged, keeping them enthusiastic about the sport because they will come out of it and they will then, once they get used to being that shape, um, you know, move through to the next levels of performance. So nobody's nobody's improvement graph is linear. Everybody has plateaus, improvements and plateaus. Um, and we, let's say at, at 17 or 18, when the guys come in, we deliberately change body shape because they might be in the weights room. They might be doing different activities that is going to affect technique um, because they, they have more uh, more powerful musculature. And with triathletes, uh, obviously, with the amount of uh, running they do and cycling, their their quads and everything else, and their bodies can be quite lean, is going to affect how they float and their ability to swim. Uh, very well and I think coaches need to be mindful of that and match it with their other activities that they're doing and um, certainly with triathletes I always laugh because we we do quite a lot of flotation drills so actually just lying in the water and floating now I know the wetsuits can 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 help in that area Um, but if you watch obviously a, a a, a triathlete trying to do a flotation drill that is lying in a streamlined position on the water the legs will start to sink very very quickly and they'll end up in almost like a vertical position rather than a horizontal position so you, we need to address those kind of issues and engage core and try and get as best we can uh, bearing in mind the other training activities that they're doing and for your listeners it might be fun but i often do a drill where They're they're standing vertically in the water, okay, floating vertically with the hands on the chest, and we do vertical kick. So the hands on the chest, and I'll say for the last 10 seconds of every minute, I want you to lift your hands in the air and your arms in a streamlined position. And, of course, with the triathletes, generally, when they put their hands up in the air, they sink. And all I see is for 10 seconds, two wrists and a pair of hands sticking out the water, and they are submerged. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit of entertainment there on the pool deck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say I want to see your face as well. 
to to rephrase my question a bit around comparing the a tra- typical triathlete, amateur triathlete's technical development with the kid that's starting swimming. Let's say you have a triathlete who know how to swim, but they're a typical triathlete, so they're not a great swimmer, and yes. uh, they, they just get around. And and you put them; they're forty years old. You put them in a group with the kids that start swimming at whatever nine years old and and you have them swim just as much the same sessions in the same group for two years until the nine-year-old kids are 11 and the 40-year-old triathlete is 42. Do you think that uh, there's something about learning the motor skills at a young age that's different than learning them at an older age as an adult onset swimmer that the the kids will just improve significantly more than the triathlete or is it possible that if you do exactly the same thing the exact the, the same amount of work uh, with the same focus that that that, that triathlete can improve a similar amount as the kids would do in terms of their technical ability. I, th- I think um, I think it's it's that kind of old analogy in that um, you know the, well there's obviously differences of rate of improvement within the individuals and often you know people we all assume and it's probably correct that for younger kids it's like it's easier to learn a language or it's easier to learn motor skills. Um, and my good feeling is that the the older athletes would take a little bit longer, but I do think they need to pay attention to it. And I think by doing some video analysis, showing them what's going on, I think I would say that the, the senior athlete would need more one-on-one or one-to-one um, coaching or tuition on that and more practice to improve the technique than the younger guys because they can sometimes pick up things very quickly um, and, and change movement patterns very quickly. Um, you know, it's almost like a sponge that they, t- they take in things uh, rapidly, whereas yeah, the older it's, athletes... It's the plasticity of the brain at that age. Yeah, uh, exactly. it, it happens automatically. Um, in, in it, it happens in a lot of things in life for those younger age groups. Um, and it is a little bit more difficult, but it's not impossible for the for the older athlete you might might have a situation where there could be some um areas that need looking at in terms of uh musculature flexibility uh that that might be affecting or adversely affecting technique that need to be addressed and that's where we go back to that question of the interdisciplinary teams so for example for us when our swimmers come in, in, in uh, at, at 18, in the first week or so, they're, they're all screened by the physio. And this physio will look at areas that could need improvement, which would then improve different techniques. So they might be very tight in the hamstrings. Or say we might look at starting technique, and then the physio will say, well, they're very st- tight in the hamstrings, so they can't get in that position on the block. So no matter how much you coach them and how much you show them and how much you try to develop that technique, it's almost a physical impossibility to do so because there are restrictions there that the physio might be able to improve, which then might be able to knock on. So for your older triathletes, you know, in consultation with the coach that could balance those inputs, that could be an area to look at. So no matter how much the coach stresses to your senior triathlete, you need to be doing this or let's look work on this. It could be very difficult for them to uh, to execute that movement. Yeah, lots of great points there, and uh, I think that that makes total sense. That that yeah, the, the older athlete could improve uh, a lot, but but it takes more deliberate uh, deliberate planning of not just deliberate practice, but actually doing things as you said, video analysis, one to one physio assessments, and and so yes. on. And yeah, rather than the the ten year old that can just through swimming and osmosis almost automatically. Yeah, like soak up everything and and improve yeah uh good uh, and uh, and then what about different sort of different types of strokes uh, what's your thought around that like different like are there many different ways to that are equally good when it comes to good swimming technique and you can take this first from a pool swimming perspective but then also maybe discuss differences between good triathlon technique and pool swimming technique mm. i think um yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to that individual differences. And I think that uh, it's being aware, especially for your coaches, that there are these different techniques. I think there are basic principles that 
everybody needs to adhere to to create forward movement through water. Um, but then we need to be mindful that there are individual techniques that are efficient for that person. And, and one of the areas that I guess coaches are guilty of is that we look at world-class swimmers and we, we say, oh, yes, Michael Phelps moves like this or so-and-so moves like this or Caleb Dressler, whoever it is, or Kate Ledecky, as you mentioned, they move like this and they swim that fast. So this must be the way to move. When that doesn't suit, you know, it's obviously very, very efficient for that person, but it doesn't necessarily transfer to the triathlete or the or the swimmer that's in front of you. So you, as a coach, you need to be mindful that what works for that person. And sometimes you need to keep your mind open because what you think is the is the best way or textbook is not necessarily the way for that person. And I would reflect on somebody like um, you going back now, who's a very good open water Olympic medalist, for example, and swam at Loughborough for a while. Um, David Davies, who was a great 1500 swimmer. And I don't know whether you remember, but Dave Haller, his coach back in uh, Cardiff, has remarked on this and several times that people always used to say, oh, he has this kind of spider type technique. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's almost like he, he goes across the water, um, you know, like an insect. And people say, that's not the way to swim. Dave, Dave said, no, 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 we're not changing that because it's very efficient for him. It works for him, and uh, and he was very um, very sure of that, and it, it actually paid off. Whereas if you got somebody else to swim like that, it wouldn't work for them. So it's two ways: it's looking at the basic principles of movement, but it's also being aware of the individual differences for that athlete and how efficiently they move through the water. In terms of triathlete triathlon and triathletes. Again, you need to look at what what they're trying to achieve. What is it? How far is the race that they're they're looking for? And, and generally, it'll be an open water race. So therefore, they need to be able to to uh, stay on course. And uh, you know, kick's probably not an important factor at the outset. It could be for the start, but once they're in the pack, they need to keep the legs balanced and. Uh, you know, efficient, and they need to keep the arm stroke not too deep, and they need to have probably a more shallow, a shallow arm stroke, maybe a bit more of a catch up. And they need well, to. Why, be, why is that? Why, why do you think they need a more well, because shallow arm stroke? When, when, um, if you look at underwater footage of different techniques, you would see that from the event range, and I can actually send you. I'll, I'll actually send you some of this because I don't know again whether you post it out. But John yeah. Skinner did publish some stuff on that famous sports scientist from the US who was head of sports science and medicine in the US and did work with us for a while. But he has a, a, a almost like underwater shots of of depth of pull for different strokes. So if you, if you reflect now on, say, the 50-meter sprinting, some guys are using the straight arm technique, some, and some will adopt that in the 100 freestyle towards the end of the race, like Duncan Scott, for example, in the last 10 meters. But you can't possibly hold straight arm because of, this, of the power that's required and strength and power to, to maintain that throughout a race lasting more than 20 seconds. So depth of pull, you're, you're, you're trying to move a hell of a lot of water at that moment, or, you know, fix on a lot of water at that time. Whereas if you're swimming the 1500 or the 8 or the 5K, 5K or the 10K, you need to have a, a shallower pull that's not create, not requiring so much force and not requiring so much strength and power. It's more efficient to have a slightly shallower shallower stroke with a bit more of an elbow bend at that time. The, the hands and the fingertips are still facing the bottom of the pool or the bottom of the lake, but it but this but the but this, the uh, the angle at the elbow is 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 less than the, the one who is the much deeper pull for the 50. And I will send you that after we've been chatting today. Yeah. Uh, and going back a little bit, uh, the basic principles that you mentioned that basically everybody should adhere to, what, what would those be? When, uh, again, I mentioned that, like the, the high elbow, so the 
the elbow is always above the uh, the, the fingers, the, fi- the fingertips, the hands are always below the the elbow at all times um, on the recovery as well. And because a lot of triathletes I see sweeping wi- very wide and often dropping the elbow at the at the uh, catch or entry level of the hand, which then affects where the catch is to the stroke. And uh, a symmetrical pull, which can be influenced by the head position because flinging your head all over the place is going to affect the limb track of the pull. Um, so you're keeping a nice balanced stroke, good connection to the, to the water with the hands, with the fingertips facing the bottom of the pool or the bottom of the lake or the bottom of the ocean, whichever you want to do. Head position still, eyes looking forward and down. And um, the hand pulling through, facing the, the fingertips facing the bottom. And often you'll see a very tight elbow bend. If you imagine a pool, you'll see sometimes as soon as they get the catch position, the hand sweeps way across the body line and is facing the pool side at the other side of the pool. And then the head lifts like crazy. So you're getting a lot of head movement there. Now, for triathletes, when they're in the open water, they need to be mindful of the direction they're swimming. So they need to be able to practice an efficient head lift for sighting um, during the race. And they can practice this in the pool as well. Even with the pool swimmers, just to bring a bit of variation in, we'll, we'll practice a sighting technique. So I might go, we're swimming 50s or something or 100s. I want you to sight every 12 and a half meters. I want you to sight every 25 meters or 12 and a half, 25, 35, just so they get a bit of variation of technique, variation of stroke. It's a, it's a little bit of a toy, I guess, for um, a variation of practice for the pool swimmers. But for our open water swimmers, that is uh, crucial because they can easily go off course. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts around stroke rate and stroke length? Yeah, I mean, for me, going back to my race profiling, I'm a massive uh, fan of of stroke rate, of looking at, at distance per stroke and stroke length and, make, and measuring those combinations and putting in practices to address that. And we will use the temp. I use tempo trainers quite a bit. You know, those little bleepers that you put in your ear and, and, and um, beeps a certain uh, stroke yep. frequency. So I use them. A lot with um, so it almost becomes ingrained and going back to um, and that would match pace as well. So I want you to swim at such and such a rate and hit this kind of pace with these number of strokes. And they'll have practiced that, albeit for the duration of their race, a section of their race. It could be a 50 of a 200 or it could be the third 25 meters off the wall at a certain rate at a certain number of strokes, at a certain time. And so when they come to the race, they don't have to think. It's almost automatic. It's their program to to perform at that frequency, at that rate, at that distance. Um, and it, it also gives them confidence because they, they stand at the beginning of the race and they almost know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to stand here. The wedge block will be at this level i dive in i do these many fly kicks at this intensity of rate i break out at whatever it is you know my first stroke will be at 12 meters or 14 meters i'll then do this i'll then do such and such um a swimmer at the london olympics had that conversation right before the race said i'm a little bit nervous i said listen all i've got to do is press this button and you just go on autopilot, enjoy the race. And honestly, Michael, you could set your watch by it for the so for the 200 freestyle. She would dive in, swim it. After the first 50, she would the next three fifties would be at 47 stroke rate, and there'd be 29.5 or 29.6 per 50. Bang, 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 bang. Because they'd practiced it that many times that it was, you know, it was autopilot. So it was performance by design. And um they, they, and we, later on, we'll talk about... When you say 47 stroke rate, uh, 47. Is, that, is that stroke cycles like... Per, the, per uh, minute. Yeah, per minute. So so if you count both arms, it would be uh, 94. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, got it. So, sorry, I interrupted you there. So go on with what you were saying. 
No, I think that would be that would be that would be that would okay. be single strokes. Beep, All right. Beep 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 beep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm I'm also a massive fan of using the the tempo trainer, uh, both like in some sets using it just to when you're trying to stay on a particular pace, have it beep when you hit the wall, and and then in other sets when you're more focusing on, for example, race pace, then knowing your kind of race stroke rate and and setting it and and maintaining that stroke rate for the duration of your intervals. So yeah, like like many ways of using the tempo trainer. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about uh, speed and power, which in particular for your shorter events is massively important, but for triathletes, especially those triathletes focusing on maybe becoming professionals and especially so in the ITU, uh, on the ITU circuit with uh, short course where the swim is of so such a huge importance. Yeah. It's very important for them as well. So what are your thoughts around developing speed and power? Well, quite recently I've been working with, with uh, some of the triathletes at Loughborough and you know, you might say in, in, in the, in the big picture of triathlon, the first 15 meters of swimming is, is a very small percentage of the overall event. If you think about the swim and the, and the run and the, uh, the bike and the run, but the, the, the triathlon coach really wanted to improve the, um, the first 15 meters and the power, you know, the speed and power of, of their triathletes. So we worked on that and made, and they said from the starting technique off the pontoon or whatever it is, that there was a marked difference and very quickly as well, because we started to put in different practices of, of kick frequency and uh, where they would break out and where they would be in the pack. So that instead of at the back end of the pack, they were coming up at the front or in with the pack and, so I think power and power and speed is is an important characteristic for for um, for all events. That, you know that it, it pays a part in in every event, and again the percentage of it is varies according to the event, obviously. But I still think it it is something that can be worked on, and um, it's a little bit of a story with this one, but. Back in the day when we talked about this reverse periodization model, we used to do a lot of speed development in terms of, um, you know, um, speed, distance over time. So we would do like assisted swimming with fins and and what have you. And we'd also do like complex training. So maybe lap pull downs in the little gym next door, then walk onto the pool deck and do a dive 25 or a dive 20, keeping the, keeping the, swim, the swim duration under 10 seconds. Um, and when I went to the Olympics in 2004, I noticed the South African men's relay absolutely flew, smashed the world record, won it, were all over the US team, absolutely incredible. And I was asking myself, where do these people train? I'd like to see what goes on here because I was getting interested in sprint exercise right then. And I went, I noticed that the University of Arizona, uh, and pretty much I said three quarters of the team were based there. And I went out to... Uh, spent some time a week there with Frank Bush and they were using, you know, like um, swim stacks with buckets on the end of a buckets for resistance and, and tied to the swimmer and they would swim out. Now we'd use something similar for, for increasing strength and power, but we didn't. Then, then I noticed they were using assisted. They were putting the fins on and doing the same thing. And I was thinking, what's going on here? They're assisting a resist and I was wondering what was going on. So I came back and talked to Dr. Henrik Comey at our place, who was very big into sprint exercise. Um, and he said, well, you've always developed speed, distance over time, but what they're doing is developing power. So they're, they're doing, you know, power is um, force times distance over time. And we would then, they were, so they were decreasing the time by the keeping – sometimes increasing the force required by the, by the weights or whatever. The distance was the same that they were sprinting over, but they were increasing the, the, the time, they were decreasing the time by adding fins or paddles as well. And, and we incorporated that into our program. And uh, we had like a, a power phase and then a sprint phase came after that. And, uh, and that seemed to pay a lot of dividends for us right there. 
So there was a difference between power and, and, and speed. And we, we also phased that and matched that with the work that was done in the gym in terms of the weights room. We did our, our lifting exercises to match that as well from you know a power phase, then a, then a speed phase. Yeah, uh, that, that's uh, that's really insightful, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that. And wh- when it comes to triathletes developing power, so going back to the the example you had there with working with the the triathletes that went from not coming out with the pack to to making the pack, uh, how much work speed and power work is really required to to make significant improvements? How, how much did they incorporate this in their training, for example? What did that look like? I th- well. When we looked at it in terms of uh, the sessions we did with them, we looked at uh, dive technique, again, specific to what they needed off the pontoon with a step through. We looked at all of that. and We looked at the flight through the air, distance from the pontoon, where they were entering the water, streamlining through the air and streamlining entry and underwater, kick frequency, dolphin kick frequency on that underwater where they were going to break out and obviously there was variations in efficiency of, of of learning techniques and so on but one of the one of the female triathletes in particular was very very good at taking that on board and i'm led to believe in the first few races that she did that the improvement was was quite marked and that she was coming up ahead of pretty much everybody else because because of, of those components that we've just addressed there. Um, and obviously it, it isn't, it's no good just doing it once and then forgetting about it. So I, I think that the triathlon, triathlon coaches then would incorporate that. So maybe they started every session or did a couple of practices within each session. They started each session with a dive and a breakout and maybe a 15 sprint. But then they did the session or they might have had little practices within the session that revisited that. So you could reinforce that skill. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know how often they did it, but I'm sure that that's what happened with that one. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and roughly how much work do you think would be needed within a session? How much uh, power work or speed work would be done in any given session? Like if, for example, if we add up the, the sprinting or power sprints that they ha- might have been, Doing, are we talking about 100 meters, 200, 300, 400? What, what, what's the scale there? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 even with a even with a sprint pool, so as you don't want to over sprint them, you need to give them enough rest in between bouts of exercise as well, and try and keep it a tense. In my opinion, ten seconds or less of uh, of exercise at that time, and enough time to recover to 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 do the next bout efficiently and. Uh, Gain the benefits from him, from them. So I would say, to, for me, and I'm just kind of getting something out of the air, but I'd say ten minutes, something like that, five or ten minutes, maybe um, something like I don't know. You start off maybe with some fins. You could wear fins, paddles if the pool allows it for a little bit of sprint. Maybe sprint twenty meters. I don't know. Do three hundred meters, twelve twenty fives. You know. One, one drill, one technique, one sprint, 20 meters, four times of 45 seconds or 50 seconds, something like that. Mm. All right. And are there any prerequisites, for example, in terms of, I'm thinking of things like muscle mass and, and, and anything else you can think of, like prerequisites that we might not think of when it comes to developing speed and power that need to be in place? I think um, for your... For the pool swimmers, obviously, they need to be big, strong, and pow- you know, to be strong, powerful, and be able to move fast for the sprint guys in the pool. When when we start looking at 800, 1500, 5K, 10K, when we start getting in those areas, it is a trade-off. So obviously, you don't want somebody to, to, to be that powerful because they, their event lasts so long and they can't carry that muscle mass um, for so long. And... Again, we touched on before. They need to be right for the for the cycling and the uh, and the duration of the event, the cycling and the run. So we don't want to over sprint. We don't want to turn your triathletes into sprint swimmers by any means. They are endurance swimmers. They are endurance athletes, should I say? And uh, we need to temper that 
and make sure that the work we do in the pool doesn't adversely affect, or in the gym, doesn't adversely affect their overall package or their overall requirements for triathlon. And uh, and that is the coach's job to balance off those kind of areas. Now, we will be advised, as you guys will, with your supplementation, your diet and nutrition, um, and maybe consult with your strength and conditioning guys to, to, to specify what, you are training for, and then they can build a specific program for you around that, or you can do your own reading and your own fuel intake um, that is required for your event. And that, and that's how I, you know I, I really think there's a little bit of speed, but it's it, and and the, um, the 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 physiology attached to that, and the physical development attached to that. You need to balance it off with what's required for the event that they're participating in. Yeah, yeah. So you have your your own ideal triathlon body, whatever that is. Uh, that yeah. also is individual, of course, and then you don't try to yeah. temper that, but yeah, keep it the way it is and, and develop speed and power within those uh, yes, within, within those, those parameters, yes. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, using swimming toys or tools. Uh, what are the ones that you think are really good and why? And what are ones that you may not think are as good. Yep. Again, I, th- I think we have touched on a, f- a few of those things now. And um, I'm not what really one for the latest products on the market. It takes me a while to uh, assess whether something is um, uh, effective or not or whether it's necessary uh, to spend big bucks on something. I mean, some people are looking for the magic bullet that they, you know, they think, oh, well, if I get this, it's going to make me great because uh, this swimmer or this triathlete, triathlete uses it, and it's probably not. They're getting endo- they're getting paid for endorsements to promote it. So uh, uh, I think we need to be uh, wary of that, and I'm not a big big fan of that. My basic toolbox, I'd, I'd say, contains a standard pull boy, um, a set of paddles, maybe varying sizes according to the event, they're swimming, finger paddles for breaststrokers sometimes, and uh, fins. Again, fins that are appropriate for the ev- event that you're trying to do. And it, uh, as I mentioned, I will use tempo trainers um, when appropriate. And I think often you can be innovative by using simple simple things. Um, for example, I might use uh, tennis balls, one in each hand, to get um, feel a forearm on the water, so yeah, I mean you can use fist drills, but tennis balls it, it, mean, it, it makes them form a fist, and so they'll swim with tennis balls, and then they'll transfer that to put tennis balls in their hands, and then they'll transfer that to full strokes, so they can get and get back the retain of feel on the water on their hands, and uh, so yeah, so the tools and equipment have their place, but I have a basic toolbox that contains the basic things. And uh, some coaches like to use snorkels. And I guess that's a good a good idea to, to so you can focus on limb track, so you can look and see what the hands are actually doing. But my argument would be that sometimes that negates body roll. Uh, they end up being too flat in the water. So I don't, I don't use them that much, but I know a lot of coaches do. And uh, it's it's just a personal preference, Michael. Um, and I think you'll find different coaches gravitate towards different things that they that they like and prefer. And uh, I like to be a little bit more creative sometimes, saying, "Well, what am I, what am I trying to achieve here? And and is there something simple that I can use to to facilitate this, rather than investing big bucks in something that you know does the same thing?" Yeah. For the triathletes, again, a lot of triathletes spend a lot of time with the pool boy. Uh, the argument being, of course, that a lot of races, especially for amateurs, are done in a wetsuit. Yeah. So the pool boy gives that flotation and it's kind of specific for the event. Uh, you don't need to develop the kick as much. And maybe also you want to save your legs for the cycling and running workouts coming up. Uh, what's your thought on that in general? And And also another question would be kind of, how much swimming would you think should be done without any tools? Just speaking in very broad strokes again. Yeah, I think um, the 
when, when we go back to this argument of specificity, and I know it's difficult in pools because they're not going to like it. If you can get outdoors, that's it. That's fantastic. But I think that you know, triathletes where possible, rather than using a pull boy. If I know, if I say, well, it's uh, it's a compromise, but I think it is a compromise. Preferably, they need to be able to swim with the wetsuit. And I know that's difficult getting permission from pools, and also that the water can be too hot to do a significant amount wearing the wetsuit. But they do, people do need to get used to swimming with a wetsuit because often they'll restrict shoulder movement. The body position will be different uh, from normal swimming technique. So where possible, they should mix and match that with a little bit of wetsuit swimming. Um, I'm not sure that we would have to look at where the pull boy, what, what the pull boy is actually doing. Is it replicating the flotation level or body position that you would get by wearing the wetsuit? Uh, again, this specificity idea. Um, sometimes I will do, and I'm actually doing it, I was doing it on Monday night, actually, um, have the pull boy at the ankles. So, you know, you swim pull boy at the regular position, do a little bit of that, and then having the pull boy at the ankles, which obviously lifts the back end, but also creates quite a bit of resistance. Uh, incre increases resistance. So that can be used as a training aid to increase a little bit of power um, and technique. And uh, to answer your question, I would, I like to do full stroke swimming a lot of the time, because again, that relates more to the event than, than anything else. As long as the technique's good and as long as the body position's right, the limb tracking's right, and the, the, the athlete. Is, is swimming efficiently yeah uh, yeah personally i do like using the wetsuit for for some of my swims as you say uh, to get the really specific training but uh, a suggestion for athletes for whom it might not be possible either because of water temperature in the pool or the pool not allowing it get a good pair of buoyancy shorts because that's going to do a better job of simulating the uh, the wetsuit position than the pool boy and also it's not going you're not going to have to keep it between your legs so you can yeah. sort of have a normal uh, leg action in in your exactly. swimming and, and it's not impeding your your strength. exactly michael because i think i think the pull boy well some people do kick with the pull boy but it, it still doesn't replicate the kind of kicking that you're going to be doing because even though even though you're um you're swimming outdoor you're swimming triathlon and you're swimming 1500 or whatever it is you're still going to get a little bit of flutter movement on the legs to balance the technique and the pull boy can affect your your body position and body roll um, a little bit. So for sure, variation, use a bit of pull boy action, use the, the shorts, use all sorts of different things in that sense, but, but always be aware of, of how it's affecting the stroke. And people sometimes like to use the pull boy as a, you know, as a, as a crutch that it, because it's easier to, often easier to pull than it is to swim and they prefer to pull because they're getting the, the, the flotation from it. And uh, yeah, most people, some people see it as a, as a resistance because it isolates or, or stops the legs and you use an arm. It's, it's an arms only drill, but the reality is the energy output. It's often easier with a pull boy than it is. And I use, and I use pulling as recovery more than anything else. I'll use it as recovery swims. And in fact, last night I did something like in between the sets, three two hundreds, one pull, paddles, one paddles, one pull. Recovery controlled. Because pull, the pull boy is um, enhancing the position and making life a little bit easier. Yeah. And and how do you use fins? Is it mostly for, for kicking or will you also use it to perhaps make drills easier or just general technique training? Yeah, I, I for fins I'll use them in, in a lot of different situations i will use them for kick uh, speed kick power kick uh drills which makes it a little bit easier to perform the drill and i'll use them for full stroke swimming as well to uh to increase speed uh assisted speed within the stroke for all strokes uh, but if we, obviously with triathlon we're, we're talking about freestyle here but to increase the power of the of of from from the back end and increase the speed that they're traveling at. So for over speed type work, I'll, I'll use the fins and often add paddles to create even more power and speed 
uh, so fins and paddles. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you mentioned a couple of times working with reverse periodization. So I'm curious to hear a bit more about yeah how, how you do that. Yeah, I mean, again, when, when we started up this thing, I, and again, there'll be different different definitions, but I would say for us, we, um, I just say we swim fast more often during the cycle and during the week, and we swim fast earlier in the cycle. So maybe in, in week two, we might come in after a break, uh, say the summer break, and then week one, we're just getting feel on the water, let's say, and then in week two, we're starting to introduce speed sets rather than the traditional model of going all the way through the first, through the winter endurance phase. We, it's not like that. We will mix it, mix the program and we will introduce speed sets um, early on. And we, did, we didn't know that that was called reverse periodization, but Tim Kerrison, who's now with, um, was with Team Sky, Sky Cycling, and now is with Ineos and is often uh, flagged up from by David Brills for the performance director as being the key to the um, the training model of the uh, the tours of that team for the tours. Tim was instrumental in, for us in uh, well, he, he came with the phrase reverse periodization and explained what it is. He said, oh, you guys, are, it's kind of reverse periodization. We said, oh, yeah. And then he, because I'm not a physiologist by any means, uh, but then he started to explain it to us and, and provided the rationale from something that we'd pretty much come to discover um, on our own. And uh, that's how I would define it. I think do, sometimes... Do, do, do you have any, we, do you have any uh, sort of any theories for why it works well for you? Um, I don't know. I think we, we just came across it by accident because I think in the past, again, people said used to use this phrase, speed through endurance. And I, well, well, how, how swimming a lot of endurance gives you, makes you fast. And my simplistic way is, well, if you want to swim fast, you've got to practice swimming fast. And sometimes I would go to, to places and go, well, you know, attendance at sessions is not a, it's not a problem because you guys are here all the time. Uh, you know, you, you do enough training, but, but you swim slow all the time. So you practice swimming slow a lot of the time, so you become very good at it. That's why your performance is not good. Your body doesn't know how to move fast because you through water because you never practice moving fast through water. And that's why we kind of introduced it very early on and carried that through the cycle Um Obviously, different amounts of it as time went by, but but that is, you know, that that that, that is our area for, because we think well, we were what our kind of philosophy was if we had somebody that was naturally fast, we could build on the aerobic endurance onto them. Now I know you know physiologists who have much more expertise than me will look at things like. Uh, aerobic and anaerobic capacity, and you can't overfill the cup and these these areas. But for us, maybe we, by by luck or whatever it is, uh, we would strike the right balance between that, and and our guys would get the right balance between speed and endurance. And as the cycle went by, um, they they would Im- improve their performance. So that's how. And again, I think did I, I, did I, I, I can send you some stuff on. Uh, the interviews with with Team Sky. Did I send you that already or not? No, no, you didn't. Uh, I'll I, send I, you that. As yeah, well. I'll just uh, take a moment to mention that Tim Carrison that you refer to here is also uh, the coach of Cam Wirth, uh, who, of course, uh, triathletes will will know of. Uh, curious here about how the the volume of fast swimming changes then from when you start the season. Does it? stay fairly constant does it increase as you get closer to to races or does it decrease because when i hear pre- reverse periodization i think that okay you do the most of your intense training early on and then actually it decreases and you increase the amount of sort of moderate and, and low intensity training but i'm kind of my my guess here and i'm conf- this is just a complete guess is that you're probably not decreasing the amount of speed when you're approaching races so can you elaborate on that 
we um well i think yeah i mean our cycle our cycles and our weeks up is periodized which matches the land conditioning as well and uh that that the two will will work in sync with each other um and i think it it probably would be like a um, maybe an in like an inverted U. So we will start off with small amounts of, of, of speed in the early parts. We would we'll gradually build the amount we're doing and going into maybe, I don't know, three weeks, depending on the person, uh, three weeks out from the meet, we will maintain a bit of speed, but we will reduce and we certainly won't over sprint in the, in the week leading to the event or the two, two weeks leading to the event. All that will have been done. We'll maintain that, but we won't over over sprint. And, and that, I think that's a mistake that people make. They're always testing their athletes, testing them, testing their speed, testing the dive capacities, just over diving, over sprinting, short distance, over pacing in the in the weeks in the week before the event. And uh, we we would stay away from that. We would keep them sharp. Keep some bouts of speed, but not over sprint. By you know doing too much of it, it just leads to fatigue, um, and it's better to to rest into the competition for a few days or a week rather than sprinting right up to the. We obviously at the competition we'd do a couple of dive bursts, twenty five meters, just to get dive fifteens, just to get some feel for it, um, but it won't be over sprinting. Yeah, uh, that, that makes total sense. Obviously, because in, that in the taper period you wouldn't uh, do too yes. much of anything, neither volume nor intensity. But I, I was kind of referring more to, uh, like, let's say you have, uh, I don't know how how long you might have from the start of the training after the summer break until the first races, but uh, basically the period until you have your two weeks out or even three weeks out if you do a three week taper from from the the most important from the main meet. Would you? Would you be increasing from the start of the training period through through that period until you get to the taper phase, or would it would the amount of speed work be constant, or would it actually be decreasing? Yeah, well, I can only speak. Well, I, I see lots of different people. They, they have different um, profile you know, profiles and so on, for, and their their periodization plans. But for me, I would look at say where the, where the target meet was. Uh, I don't know, let's say it was 12 weeks or 15 weeks. Then I would start off a week getting the feel of the water. Then the next week I'd start introducing the speed sets and they would gradually increase in uh, in volume, duration, numbers of speed sets in the week um, until the midpoint. So let's say if it was a 15 week, maybe week seven, I'd, I'd set up a competition right then. They would, might have had a one before. That would be a, a mid-cycle target competition we might do a week's a little mini taper mini drop there we'd we'd race then and then we'd start go back up again for a second inverted u and then back down for the um back down for the three week taper if it's if that's appropriate for the athlete and it does depend on the athlete uh, some just like a one week drop some three weeks some maybe what even five weeks or whatever it is but it would be that kind of um, wave pattern that we would do with the with the with the amount of speed that we're we're incorporating into the program into the sessions. All right, yeah, that that explains it. Thanks. And uh, what are your thoughts around performance testing? Right. Well, uh, um, I'm not a massive fan of performance testing. Or oh, again, I'll I'll go back to we will we will have profiling from the races that they'll do which will then in the race situation we will then incorporate that and those components into our training program or into the training program um i have used lactate testing in the past but i'm not a i'm not a slave to that i haven't used that for a while um the, the physiologists would come in and do that and crunch the numbers and give us the training paces but again i found that was very individual and uh you know, you might say, "Oh well, you know, they, they go, I want them to swim our oh, threshold traditionally. I don't know, three to four millimoles or something." 
But for that athlete, it's it's not appropriate. They can tick over at a 160 or 170 heart rate and they're not even breathing heavy. So it's like, well, <laughs> you know, it's, so it's not appropriate. I know there's always individual differences. Um, and we, we have had some one or two test sets, done things like that. But really, I guess the profiling would be the test set. So we would have, they would go, right, I don't know, for the breaststroke guys, I want you to go, we're looking at dive 30s because these are the first 30 metres of your of your race. Um, you guys that are aiming for this, we have charts that would would track how generally a race is swum. And these actually came from Tim Kerrison. And um, they, they were like broken down in time to 15 metres, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, so on. Like that, 65 metres, whatever it is. So I could then put those into the training program. And let's say I was doing dive 30s with the breaststroke guys. Our target pace for the overall 100 is I want you to swim 102 or something or 101 or 60. I would know from these charts what would be appropriate or what our target is for them to swim for 30 metres, what they would do on the underwater pullouts, how it would be. So I guess... What you're doing is that is a test in a way because you're but you're setting a protocol and you and you're incorporating them into your training session. But if it comes to things like, you know, some people use heart rate monitors, and uh, we might do a little bit of that. But again, that's not something that I would use on a general general basis. Uh, and again, lactates have used haven't used them for a long time. Understand them a bit. But, yeah, I get guidance from the physiologists. So generally, it, it, it is more of these kind of sets. When um, – if we're doing what we would call a heart rate set, which is a set which could last something like – it varies between 600 to 1,200 meters, um, and it's broken down into sets of, let's I don't know, 75 meters or 100 meters bounce, and then and – Swimming at an intensity which would be 10 to 15 beats below max, that sort of intensity. Um, and the rest interval is more than the actual swim swim time. So that's the intensity you're talking about. We would, would look at them. And what I would find is that you might say it's obvious, but mid-cycle we might be doing um, 1,200 meters of that. As we as we start resting off a little bit from like six weeks out, seven weeks out, as we start to gradually increase the or decrease the the, the bouts that we're doing or the, the size of the set, then I start to see as I start to rest, the times that they're kind of recording become markedly faster. And then I can, they get confidence and I'm getting confidence that things are starting to happen right here. I can see they're getting ready now for, um, you know, for some fast swimming. So I, I can think about a couple of female athletes. That, again, this is short course because I find short course swimming is very good for those kind of sets because they, they can crank up a fair bit of speed. But mid, mid cycle, say they're going hundreds off 145 or two minutes, they'd be going 59s, six, 59s, that sort of pace. As soon as we start, getting to like six weeks out, seven weeks out from the major taper and we're doing, I don't know, six, 600 metres of that or 400 metres of that, they'll be getting down to doing like 56s or 57s. Now, these are world-class swimmers, but there is a market difference right there and they're looking good in the water. They, they look fresh, full of life, and, and you might say, well, that makes sense because they're doing a hell of a lot less than they're doing. But, but that's the kind of test set I might use or analysis that I might use. Yeah, yeah. Like basically using certain benchmark workouts and some of them are simulating exactly. races. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, what are a few uh, one to three common mistakes related to swimming or even just endurance training in general that you see athletes doing regularly and that you would uh, want to uh, tell our listeners to avoid, basically? Yes, Mike, uh, Michael, I think we've, we, we've touched on one or two of these already, but uh, I'd say coming to the pool and swimming up and down with poor technique and at a slow pace continuously and thinking that that's going to 
improve performance and oh, I've done my swim session and that's not happening, you know, and looking for the magic wand. And this comes back to the, the specialist kit. Something new comes on the market or uh, Caitlin Decky stands there and Ma- or Michael Phelps or Lockte or, you know, I'm going back now, or um, Caleb Dressel or whoever it is or Chad Leclerc or, you know, buy this product, it'll make you go fast. Buy this suit, it'll make you go fast. The reality is they're looking for the magic bullet or the best triathlon bike spending thousands and thousands on something when they're a novice triathlete. Now, it might help, but end of the day, you know, you, you, you buy this fantastic race suit and you're not in shape. Well, it's not going to, you know, you, you're wasting a lot of money right there. Or you, or you have a fantastic supplementation and your absolute basic diet's no good. I mean, it's that sort of thing, that looking at the basics and not looking for the magic bullet. And I do think that, again, triathletes should vary the distances, the intensities. They should concentrate on technique and incorporate, which I sent you some information this morning, incorporate some basic skills of, and drills for swimming and for technique like flotation, like sculling, um, and concentrate on those kind of things, which will be uh, be beneficial to their overall performance. Excellent. Yeah, that's a really good a good list of, of things to think about. And uh, what are one to three things within swimming or endurance sports that you're currently fascinated by? Uh, maybe you're learning more about some specific topic or you have recently started to uh, to incorporate something in training. So, uh, yeah, whatever you want to to plug here. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I think for anyone in any field that's curious, that we're always learning. We're learning from other sports and we're learning from coaches. And I have, you know, I'm very inquisitive like that, uh, from business experts in the field. It all fascinates me. All of it fascinates me. And I'm... I, I, I like to find out things. I was doing a talk for somebody, a business talk about uh, performance environment, and one of the listeners was um, a business guy, but his passion and interest was soccer, and and he was getting involved with some projects in soccer. So he called me up, and we had a great – and I thought, yeah, this is very interesting. So I decided to find out more about um, soccer and youth development in soccer, and we're going off tangent a little bit. But I think as coaches – um, as as athletes that are into our business, we need to be curious about many many things. You know, widening your experience and your professional development is absolute key. And, and I'm going back in time a little bit now, but Ben Titley, who's now one of the world's, you know, most successful coaches, that was at Loughborough with myself, and now heads up the High Performance Center in Toronto. Um, works for Swimming Canada. When when he worked with us at Loughborough, he went to um, McLaren Racing to look at the development of their cars and spent the day there in McLaren, and uh, and and he came back with some great ideas. We would bring in like ballet dancers to work with our swimmers. He brought in a Russian ballet dancer to to look at core stability and balance and poise. So we can learn so much from 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 so many people. I mean, the opportunities are endless. And generally you'll find that, and again, I'm lucky because I'm surrounded by these guys, that most people are always willing to chat with you, help you, give you some information. And, and a mistake is to think that we, we that we know it all. And clearly we don't. And the more you get to know, the less you, less you realize you know. So, you know, be curious and, and, and seek out ideas. And something they might not be, you might say, oh, well, like today, you might say, well, I don't agree with that. And that's fine as well. You know, you'll find by looking to see or listening to as much as you can, you'll begin to formulate, your, we'll go back to the beginning, your own model and your own style that works for you and which your athletes will believe in and will be successful with, as long as you're not too out there, let's say. But then again, how do you find what's too out there? And I often see myself as a coach. There's I like nothing better than that. Than you know, you you think somebody they do something a performance that's absolutely amazing, and you think 
how how did how was that possible? You know, they haven't done this, they haven't done that. They don't, but they actually perform, and, and I, I'm intrigued by it, and I'm intrigued by going to see different coaches in different programs of how they do things, and some of it you pick up little ideas, and other stuff you're thinking, I, you know, it might work, but I, I just couldn't deliver that. I just couldn't, and um, yeah. So that's that's what uh, that's 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 my thing. Always learning. Yeah, that, that's really great. And uh, what you said there about uh, people are generally willing to chat and share. This podcast is a great example. It lives and dies by by the fact that people like you come on here and uh, and share your knowledge and experience. Uh, also, uh, just one thing that came to mind here: you mentioning taking influence from very different different sports. Uh, right now on Netflix, there is a, a show called The Playbook, which is uh, basically each episode is uh, is about a, a coach in a given sport. So I just started watching it uh, the other oh, day right. on the bike. And uh, the first one is about basketball. Uh, but uh, then they have coaches like uh, Jose Mourinho from football and uh, yeah, some yeah, other famous yeah. coaches. So, so that that's something that uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to looking and learning from coaches in many many different different sports. Exactly, Michael, and and I think the I, I think as coaches, we're individuals as well. So we, you know, something might work for one person but doesn't work for another because they because we can't deliver it in the same way. We don't have the same passion for it as they do. And and it quite often can go against traditional thinking, but it works for them. And uh, but we need to just keep an open mind uh, and take from that. And again, like you, you know, with the business guys, I'll often refer to the soccer and Mourinho and Arsene Wenger and these these people who have been successful in their time, uh, Guardiola. There's a huge, a range, huge range of information out there, variety of information that we can all benefit from. Business guys, business, anybody that's successful and passionate about what they do, you can always learn things from them. And performance environment is not just about sport. High performance gra- gravitates; it's 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 involved in business, the arts, uh, you know, any any of those fields. Always embrace excellence in whatever field it is yeah. because we can learn from that I, I am going to try to pin you down to say a specific thing though that <laughs> that you have recently been learning about for, perhaps or trying to to implement so if you can give an example a specific example yeah i mean during the during the uh this lockdown period for one of a better word obviously we were having lots and lots of zoom sessions and um I uh, pretty, pretty much zoomed out, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I I um, signed into some different ones, and I, I, I signed into one for British canoeing. And uh, actually, a, sort of a colleague or friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mustafa Seka, was on there talking about resilience and um, challenge and support environments. And I took a fair bit from him on resilience, robust resilience, rebound resilience, robustness or rebound resilience. And uh, that made me reflect on things like directional anxiety. And so I think it, what happens is you go to something like that, it tweaks your your mind, and then you want to learn more things about it. So that area was, uh, was an area I looked at. And then – and here's the one that's quite interesting for you because – like you said today, and I've enjoyed chatting with you immensely. Um, and it's it's my business; it's the things I do. So uh, that's been great. But then a, co- a coach asked me to do a session for their federation. I won't mention it, right? So I said, "Oh yeah, no problem. I'll talk to your coaches." And I thought it was just going to be a nice Zoom chat. Anyway, he sent me the the sessions through, right? The questions. He asked asked them to submit questions, mate. Every, I'd say eight out of the 10 questions were to do with the physiology and effects on training on with female menstrual cycles, right? And I was like, oh, my word, because that is not my area of expertise by any means. So I thought, well, I better know. It took me six hours to do prepping note for it, <laughs> six hours. Yeah. yeah. So fortunately, fortunately, Michael, about a week before that, I would. I had actually listened to a, a podcast by Emma Hayes, 
who's the fo- women's football coach. Uh, is she at Chelsea now or last? Anyway, I don't know. But she, one, professional football. And she incorporates all the data from the physiologist into her training programs for her players. And it's, it, it's the, the menstrual cycles of the athletes. It, it, it fits around all of that. And I'd listened to that about two weeks before. So I did have some information and some inkling. But then I talked to a volleyball coach who does the same things or had done the same things. So I did have some knowledge to start with, but I did need to do some prepping for it. Yeah, uh, that's actually a fascinating topic. And there's a recent meta-analysis that uh, I have talked about on this podcast in a recent Yeah, that, Q&A, you could bring Q&A somebody Q&A in episode. on that, mate. You could bring somebody in for future reference. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, they're from uh, Northumbria University, I think, is the research group that did that did that, uh, that uh, review. But uh, let's move on f- to the rapid-fire questions. So take okay. one sentence to answer these. And uh, the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to swimming or endurance sports? Um, I use lots of different lots of different resources, as, as you could pick up from what I've said. So like the business world, sporting world, the arts world, wherever excellence is taking place, wherever I get an opportunity, I will seize those, those um, resources. So networking is an absolute vital for me looking at experts in the field and again at Loughborough I'm surrounded by a lot of experts in the field so that is my resource experts in the field being inquisitive and seeking out that information perfect and what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment all righty so I would for me again we've mentioned already I'd say fins tempo trainers uh, stroke rate monitors, I, that, all those things. But I'll tell you what, you know what the best piece of equipment for a coach are? Your own ears and your own eyes. So look at what's going on and listen to what's going on. Listen to your athletes. Keep, look at your athletes. Because quite often I'll go to a program and the coach will tell me something's happening and clearly in front of them, that's not what's happening. And you see it even on um, stroke technique videos, uh, Twitter, the Instagram or whatever, somebody will post a video and say, look at this technique or look at this. I'm using the paddles to, to create this. And you look at it and it's clearly not happening in front of you. Okay? Or, or the swimmer swimming this big. So use your own eyes and your own ears to, to, to see and listen. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Don't forget your eyes and ears at home when you turn up to practice. And uh, finally, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Um, for me, there's, there's a few, Michael. I would, and I think this goes for a lot of coaches. Reliability. So your athletes to see that you're reliable, that you're there all the time, you're fully committed to the program and to them. You're relentless in your pursuit of performance for them and for the program. You're... You never lose sight of the goal, the pursuit of the goal, doing whatever it takes to help the athletes achieve their goals, take them to places they didn't think possible, trustworthiness, all of those kind of uh, phrases, that, 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 they are key t- for me. Perfect. Ian, this has been a great pleasure. I've enjoyed it immensely. And uh, this is one of the longest uh, interviews I've done in living, oh, in, living, in, 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 living, in living memory. No, no, it's... Mate, it's all, I talk a lot and I get excited. <laughs> it, it, it's all good. I I, all, I I tend to manage like the, the questions such that the interviews run to a length that I generally like them to go to. But I just wanted to hear all your answers to all the questions. So <laughs> Feel all free to edit how you wish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, no, I just want to thank you for your time and uh, for sharing everything that you have shared with us. And uh, is there any, do you have any social media or presence or anything you want to uh, to plug it or share with the listeners? Uh, no, I don't mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not on uh, Twitter or anything like that or Facebook. I just kind of do what I do really, mate. So I've, I've enjoyed it too. It's been fantastic. And I, I hope you guys take something away from it. And uh, all I can say is I don't know all the answers, I've been around a long time. I'm still learning. And I hope I'm better next year than I am 
this year and I was the year before. I hope I'll continue to get better as a coach and continue to get better as a person for my athletes and that they will continue to get better too. That's a real note to end on. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks a lot, mate. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com and I will have links to all swimming-related episodes of the podcast there and also a couple of resources that Ian sent me after the interview, including an Instagram video about the loping technique he mentioned as well as a YouTube video with Tim Carrison about the use of science at Team Sky. Also, I want to just mention again something that I have mentioned before, but on the podcast page on scientifictriathlon.com, we now have a filter by category function. So you can essentially just click the swimming category and see all the episodes related to swimming or similarly for cycling, running, uh, nutrition, racing, training, science, and all number of categories. So that is really handy. I hope that you find it useful. Uh, Go and check it out on the podcast page on scientifictriathlon.com. On Thursday, we have another Q&A coming out. And then next Monday, I interview Olav Alexander Bu, who is the sports scientist of the Norwegian Triathlon Olympic team. Uh, so he works very closely with Adil Tweiten, who I've interviewed uh, a couple of times before on the podcast and uh, is heavily involved in everything that's going on with uh, Christian Blumenfeld, Gustav Eden, Kasper Stornes, and uh, the other boys and girls at the team that have been making such headway in ITU and Ironman 7.3 racing in recent years. So that is a really exciting one. Stay tuned for that next week. If you are interested in coaching services, training plans, uh, training camps or the like, then also go and check out scientifictriathlon.com. We have those products and services uh, there with lots of information and you can always email me with further questions if you want more information about that Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and get a free hydration plan and get an estimate for how much sodium you lose in your sweat. And you can use that information to select an electrolyte supplement from Precision Hydration, preferably, but anywhere if you so choose. If you do it from Precision Hydration, of course, use the promo code DETTRAFLONSHOW15 to get 15% off. And thank you to Roca that you can find on roca.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.